I'm Cindy Kelly. I'm in Santa Fe. This is Monday, February 6, 2017. And I'm with Floyd Agnes Lee, better known as Aggie. And I'd like to start by asking um, Aggie to say her full name and spell it. My name is Floy, F-L-O-I, Agnes, A-G-N-E-S, Lee, L-E-E. -E. I'm a Pueblo Indian, half Pueblo and half white. My father is from Santa Clara, Pueblo, and my mother is a German-American. She came from Indiana as a teacher to teach in the boarding school in Santa Fe and met my Indian father who was teaching tailoring, which he had learned there. And then they were transferred to Albuquerque Indian School. And uh, at uh, the Indian School, there were five of us that were born, and, and I'm the fourth of the uh, five siblings siblings, and I uh, grew up in the Indian school, although did not go to the uh, school itself. I was sent to St. Mary's, then to Albuquerque High School, where I graduated, and from there I went to uh, the University of New Mexico. I was uh, uh, interested in biology. And I got my degree at, uh, at the University of uh, New Mexico. Uh, while there, I had a, um, a job um, helping uh, one of the professors with his plants to see how they grew. And I put different um, solutions into each plant. So that made me more interested in doing research um, when I graduated from university, the um, professor, Castetter, uh, who was head of the biology department, uh, asked me to stay another month and do some research for him, which I had been doing, I shouldn't say. But anyway, uh, it was... Uh, recording information on uh, what the Indians ate uh, before the, uh, um, the states became united. And uh, I had to go through uh, different uh, uh, books which were in the library and, and pick out the information. We hadn't, I hadn't quite finished doing uh, the research and I was, uh, looking forward to going to Indiana after graduation to see my relatives, my white relatives, and uh, on my mother's side. And uh, I um, uh, was ready to go and he asked me would I stay another month and finish the work. And I uh, sort of, uh, yes, yes I will. Um, so while I was uh, doing the research for him, uh, he got a call from Los Alamos. Los Alamos wanted a um, biology student uh, or a graduate to come and uh, uh, work in the laboratory, which uh, the hematology laboratory. And uh, he asked me, would I like to go to Los Alamos and work there? And I did not have a job lined up, so I, I said yes. So that's how I got to Los Alamos. Can and, you tell us, uh, uh, just to interrupt, what, what date this is? Is 1943? What, what, what date? Yeah. It was in 1945. Uh, uh, and the bomb was being developed at that time. And my uh, assignment was to take, collect the blood from the uh, 
uh, research men who scientists who were uh, working on the atomic bomb. I had to learn uh, how to do take blood, how to read the blood cells, what type of blood cell, and all that's connected with uh, the hematology. So I got uh, um, along real well in that area, and so they, they send me uh, to go to different sites where the uh, production was being done, and I would draw the blood from individuals. Some of the scientists would come into the laboratory, and so when I worked in the laboratory, I was assigned uh, certain people, certain scientists. One of them was uh, Enrico Ferrari, and we got to talking about what uh, I liked to do and what he liked to do, and we got on the subject of tennis. Now, I did not know that this was Enrico Ferrari. I only knew him as a number because they wouldn't give names out. And um, so we would play tennis. This was before the bomb was blown, and then afterwards also. But, but um, uh, I always uh, looked at him as a, uh, he was a short man and he had a, a funny little hat. But anyway, after the bomb was dropped, the GIs who worked at the laboratory, they were engineers, we had uh, three or four working in the hematology lab, came up and shook my hand and said, you were the uh, person who uh, stuck the uh, hand of, of the great Enrico Fermi. And I said, what? And I said, and I said yes, Enrico Fermi. And I said, oh, I can't believe that, because I was beating him in tennis every time. So when we went out to play tennis later, I didn't be, <laughs> I tried not to. <laughs> we became very, very good friends. Um, Los Alamos was a, a, a very, very interesting place. Um, we had, uh, we were uh, sort of uh, in a, like in a prison, but you could get in and out if you had the right uh, uh, cards. And we could go to Santa Fe, and which we did on certain occasions. And then uh, there were rec recreations like ice skating and the tennis and all kinds of uh, activities that went on. And I lived in a dormitory um, where uh, several other women lived, and when they, Enrico Fermi was being, um, um, he decided to go back to the University of Chicago and teach after the bomb was dropped. So we were going to have a big party for him, which we did. And we had the party in the dormitory, and there was a fireplace where I sat on the fireplace, the fire wasn't going, and sat down, he came over and sat with me and he said, now that the bomb has been dropped, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I want to go and study more about what radiation does to uh, um, living cells. He said, you come to the University of Chicago. And I said, come to the University of Chicago. <laughs> I lived in New Mexico. <laughs> and um, I thought about that and thought about it. And I said, you know, my mother came from Indiana. And she ended up in New Mexico. She taught at different Indian schools on the way. Uh, the Winnebago Indian schools up in Wisconsin. and ended up teaching at Santa Fe and then Albuquerque Indian School. And I said, if my mother was brave enough to leave um, 
Indiana and uh, come that far, <laughs> then I can go to Chicago. <laughs> so my father, my Indian father, and I went to, to Chicago because he wanted to see where I was going to be. And um, he looked at Lake Michigan and he said, all of that water and none in New Mexico. <laughs> and so he was impressed. <laughs> so I, um, I started working at Ar uh, Argonne National Laboratory uh, full time. And before I tell you about that, I'll have to tell you how I got to Argonne. At Los Alamos, there was a radiation accident after the bomb was dropped, and 14 people were involved. And Sloten was the uh, principal uh, person who uh, was attending the uh, assembly of the uh, fission of the, of, the, of the particles of the um, atom bomb. He, uh, an accident happened and he was uh, completely exposed and behind him was uh, L. Graves and L. Graves was half irradiated and the other half was not, he was shielded. So I was assigned to take the blood of L. Graves and uh, a Sloten. Al Graves, uh, his, uh, he wouldn't go to the hospital. He wanted to stay home. So I had to uh, go to his house to take his blood. And one day I took a sample and, and read it and it was very, very low. His white blood cells were very, very low. So everybody in the lab said, oh, Maggie, you, you must have made a mistake. And uh, go on back and get another sample. So I said, um, okay. But I uh, wondered if I was going to give myself away and let them know that uh, what was going on. Because I felt that I had done the right thing. So I went back and got another sample and read it, and someone else read it, and sure enough, his white blood cells were so low that he, they didn't even understand why he was still living. Um, I'll tell you more about that later. Sloten, um, began to uh, um, increase in size. His, um, he became a, a, I don't know what you call it, like a balloon. And um, it was difficult to take its blood. I finally had to get the, take it from the ear. His mother and father were called because they knew he wasn't going to live. It was just nine days after the, uh, the accident. I was taking his blood and his parents came and stood in the uh, hall, um, doorway and looked in and saw him. He was just like that, just bloated. And the look on their face it was terrible. But anyway, I got out of there and sure enough, the next day he died of radiation poisoning. Al, I'll go back to Al Graves. He um, cooperated in every sense um, in, in uh, not uh, uh, cutting his hair or shaving his uh, beard, and I didn't mean beard, I mean mustache, whatever. And so he, he went around with, with normal face, and the other face was um, uh, terrible. But um, he, um, 
he came through this very well. He, uh, I, I don't remember how long it took before his hair started growing back again and his eyebrows. And, but he, um, he came. And I was at a, um, at a meeting in a, uh, at Argonne, and I met Al Graves, who was talking with the director of, uh, uh, of the laboratory. The director was a very snooty person. He didn't like for anybody to interfere with him. He was, he, um, he'd rather have the elite uh, around him than talking to him. But I hadn't seen Al Gray for 10 years, and uh, I ran over and, and just hugged him. And he hugged me and the, the, the director said, oh, he, he wondered what was going on. <laughs> you know, we, were, we remained very good friends, and um, he and his wife and I and, and several other uh, people from Los Alamos would go skiing. Uh, in Colorado, and I went hiking with them. That was when I came back uh, from Argonne on vacation. Um, now, I started out by getting to Argonne National Laboratory in the University of Chicago. So I was going to school and working eight hours. And um, I, I, mar I married a, a graduate student in the same uh, uh, biology division, and she said was all of it. <laughs> and, but he, he had cancer, not on one, and he died when she was two years old. And I was going to put him through school, and then he was going to put me through school. But uh, I continued to work and I decided I went to Chicago to get my PhD and I'm going to get it. So I worked and went to school and it took me about 14 years to get, to get the PhD and I was in my 40s when I got it, but I, I did it. Um, the, the type of uh, work that I did uh, at Argonne was um, uh, not uh, related to anything that I did at Los Alamos, except that I was interested in what radiation did with uh, lymphocytes and the other cells. So at Argonne, I was able to um, research the effects of radiation on living cells, which were cancer, uh, uh, normal cells, and they had, could be from anybody. I mean, we were mainly with rats and mice and hamsters. And I have several publications on the effect of radiation on these animals and their blood cells. And so I stayed at Argonne for about 22 years, and um, returned to New Mexico because I uh, I really didn't like living in Chicago. No sunshine and rain all the time. Um, I then um, got a job at uh, Pasadena Medical Foundation uh, and uh, stayed there uh, for a couple of years as director of, of tissue culture. Um, and because I had uh, worked with, uh, I didn't mention chromosomes, I did a lot of work with the effects of radiation on chromosomes because I had done a lot of research on that. The um, Jet Propulsion Lab was looking for someone who um, who had this experience, and I had three publications with two other uh, authors. Uh, I was not the main author. The, the fellow who developed the machine to look at the chromosomes, uh, was a, um, uh, 
uh, assisted uh, uh, computer assisted machine, a microscope that was connected to a computer. And that was what they were looking for, was someone at that uh, Jet Propulsion Lab that had, that had been involved in that. So I worked for seven years at um, the Jet Propulsion Lab in that capacity, so using their um, uh, computer that uh, photographed the foot of uh, the astronaut that uh, landed in the, on the moon. And, and, uh, and, um, Were you in Pasadena, California? Were you in California? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yes, it was in California. I forgot to say that, yeah. Um, so then um, the contract that we had at Jet, uh, Jet Propulsion Lab ran out, so I returned to Los Alamos. <coughs> and did not continue that type of work. I worked with uh, um, plutonium and um, other uh, radioactive materials. And uh, I, I say I retired from Los Alamos, and actually I had only five years, I mean at uh, Argonne, uh, I mean Los Alamos, I had only five years at Los Alamos, but you could retire. And that's where I finally retired, decided after I was age uh, 60 to, uh, to do something else. Uh, because for 45 years I had been doing um, research, uh, biological research, uh, particularly with the effects of uh, radiation. What did you do after you retired? After I retired? <laughs> I really retired. I played tennis and I played golf. <laughs> I did some artwork uh, and I read it, it all depended on what I was not able to do. I just relaxed, <laughs> didn't, didn't write any books or anything else. But you earned it. I'm I'm surprised you beat Fermi in tennis. <laughs> he he was a great athlete. Yes, he was. Uh -huh. You must be a super athlete. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you still playing tennis? Uh, no, I had to quit golf because of my eyesight. I couldn't see the where the ball went. <laughs> that's that's a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. I um looked through the microscope and uh, uh, for 45 years I figured that uh, out. And uh, I think that, um, and uh, I, uh, certainly a, a radiation material of which we had on slides. Um, and I have a feeling that um, perhaps maybe the uh, exposure to all that light coming from uh, radioactive material and uh, the light from the microscope had something to, to help develop my uh, blindness. But I don't know. That's another research project. Did you get a sense for who, uh, what kind of person Louis Sloton was? Uh, I, the only time I experienced being with Sloton was in the hospital taking his blood, but he uh, had um, several people come and they would talk about uh, uh, mainly physics. And I do remember Philip Morrison, that he came quite often and they would discuss uh, things in the future, which I did not understand. But um, he, uh, he went so fast that um, it was uh, almost impossible to last probably three days to, to even talk to him. Yeah. One um, uh, 
thing about uh, Al Graves, that when I went back to get his blood, I forgot to tell you this, that he, he looked at me sort of funny, but uh, I said, uh, Al, I borrowed Bill White's bicycle to come and get your, I mean, I, I borrowed his bike to take your blood cells back to the lab, and I dropped the, the, uh, the, the whole thing, and then they broke the, the little glass uh, apparatus that we put the, the uh, blood cells in. And I said, I, they broke. And I said, I have to come back and get some more blood. And he said, okay. So he, he was very cooperative. And that was after 10 years, he said to me, he said, Aggie, he said, it, it was written all over your face when you came back to get my blood the second time. <laughs> and I was trying so hard not to let him know that uh, there was something wrong. When, when Alex and I, Alex here and I first talked about this interview to set it up for you, I mentioned to her that you told me that they weren't sure if they would hire you because of your father being from Santa Clara. Yes. And it was too close. Yes. Um, they felt that the, my, my father being Santa Clara, but born in Santa Clara, Boapolo, although he was not uh, living there anymore, and the, all the, his relatives were, and my relatives, he, um, they decided that uh, maybe I shouldn't uh, be able uh, to work at Los Alamos because he might uh, uh, get secrets, and I don't know how he would do it. But um, finally, they they said, uh, "Okay, you can go, but your father can't come visit you. He, he can't come get near near the lab." <laughs> But I could go visit him, <laughs> and so that's the way we did it. And I finally, after the bomb was dropped, I got my father up <laughs> to see where I, what I was doing, and where I worked. And uh, everybody in the uh, dormitory, there was the, the women's dorm dormitory and men's dormitory, and we all got together and uh, had a little party for him, and uh, he enjoyed it so much. I bet he was very proud of you. Well, I guess. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> you got that. <laughs> right. yeah. So were, were there many other people from the Pueblos working at the laboratory? They were, uh, yeah, well, it was, the chef was uh, Santa Clara, and um, uh, uh, my technician was Maria Martinez's uh, uh, aunt. Her name was Pilar Aguilar. She was my technician at Los Alamos the second time I came back. And, but uh, 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 I don't know of, of uh, at the time when I was there that there were any other uh, Indians working in the same capacity I was. Um, I almost didn't get hired at Los Alamos the second time. Uh, I am um, uh, uh, because I was a minority was one of the reasons the uh, head of the uh, division I was to be in um, uh, did not like um, minorities and uh, because I was an Indian and uh, I I just to never realize why uh, he had it uh, against me. Uh, and, but uh, that's the way 
the world is sometimes. <laughs> But, but eventually you did work for that person? You worked for him? Yes, I, not well, I, I worked on, uh, he was the uh, head of the division, but I worked with some other uh, group leader. That was in the 70s, right? Yes, in the 70s, second time, second, 70s. Second time. Did, you, did you feel discriminated uh, or discrimination during the Manhattan Project? Did you have that same feeling? Now he, he, now he was the only one I, first time I was at Los Alamos, uh, there was no discrimination that I was aware of. Yeah. Everybody was, we didn't know that we were working on the atomic bomb, except for the yeah, physicists. Uh, we thought they were doing chemical war, uh, warfare. Uh, and, um, they, they had the wax, and uh, the uh, army engineer uh, uh, men, soldiers, and they felt as they let Santa Fe know that the reason the wax were there, they were hiding pregnant wax. <laughs> and they, the Santa Fe, Love that story. I mean, they believed it. <laughs> but there were a lot of babies born in Los Alamos. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of babies born in Los Alamos. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> were you one of the few women technicians when you were in the Manhattan Project? Were there many women technicians on the Manhattan Project? Yes, they, uh, well, there were th uh, three women and, and uh, there were three, three soldiers. Uh, but there were women, there were uh, quite a few women working in different capacities. Uh, so I, I, I don't think they, uh, there was any, uh, overloaded with eight men or women it was probably equal. I never thought of that, but I, I but think going back in my memory, uh, it didn't seem like there were more men than women, maybe a while. In, in your career, they want to know, did you ever feel discriminated against because you were a woman scientist? No, only, uh, I mean, in Los Angeles. As a matter of fact, when I was in Chicago, they didn't know I was an Indian. They thought I was in either Czechoslovakia or uh, one of the European countries. <laughs> How about as a woman scientist, did you feel discrimination? Well. The, uh, my uh, my only experience was Los Alamos. There was there was um, Dr. Mary Lou Ingram and I uh, worked together at the Pasadena Foundation for Medical Research in a jet propulsion lab, and um, we were the only two women scientists in the uh, department of uh, it was called a health research laboratory and uh, with any d degree they it, it just seemed to be one individual that was uh, discriminating against women that was at the jet propulsion laboratory no that's no, at los alamos at los alamos no, that, just that jet, one person at, yeah. at, at the jet propulsion lab it was a great place yeah. Yeah. Talk a little bit about Santa Clara and your family history, how your father ended up becoming a teacher and, and that, because that's a good story too. Well, my father at the age of uh, five years of age was sent to Santa Fe Indian boarding school because his brother, who was a year older, 
could not go. There was one um, boy in the family that had to be sent to the school, the boarding school. So he, at five years of age, he uh, um, was playing in the back uh, buildings where there was a, a lot of bushes. And he and his friend were running around and a, and I'm going to do the, 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 a white man, because this is the way he described it. A white man shot him in the stomach, thinking he was a rabbit. So his parents came down in a wagon, drawn uh, by two horses, of course, and um, they uh, picked him up from the Santa Fe uh, Hospital because they couldn't do anything for him. They, he was going to die. So they took him back and put him in the Kiva, and then the medicine men worked with their herbs on his uh, uh, wounded, wounded area. And he, he survived <laughs> and went back to school. And, uh, became a tailor. They, they uh, at the time, were only given the Indians a 10th grade education and the rest of it was uh, um, uh, manual training. And so he became a tailor and he was so good as a tailor, they decided to keep him on when he graduated as, a, as the head tailor. And uh, that was back in 19, uh, probably 13 or 12, something like that. And that was unusual for that to happen, to have an Indian responsible for uh, uh, some, um, or for being a tailor master. But he also uh, played the French horn and he was a, a head of the band, uh, the, uh, the musical band. Um, and then, of course, as he uh, taught for maybe two or three years, and my mother came along, and my mother uh, was, I say, was destined to marry an Indian. And the reason for that is that she would tell me that she read uh, books on Indians, any book she could find. She was so interested in Indians that she decided that she was going to teach the Indians and that she became a teacher and uh, uh, the, taught the Indians in Winnebago, Indians uh, in Wisconsin and the Indians in Michigan and uh, at Haskell Indian School before she went to New Mexico. And the, really the reason she got to New Mexico is they thought she had tuberculosis and that she should come and pry out. <laughs> and that's when she met my father who was teaching and, and of course she was a teacher. And um, She taught uh, for a few years at uh, Albuquerque Indian School and uh, she uh, was an academic teacher and one of the things that she taught was art and a couple of uh, famous art, Harrison Begay, uh, and I can't think, uh, were students of hers and she would uh, help them with their artwork. She wouldn't do anything. She said, I just gave them uh, something they were doing wrong or, or do this or do that, you know. And, uh, but she, uh, she quit teaching after, I guess, having five children. <laughs> wow. So what year were you born? Uh, 1922. I'm 94. <laughs> Amazing. Old. 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 Amazing. Wow. So are your other siblings still living? Am I one? 
Your brothers and sisters. No, there are no. Uh, no. My brother died uh, probably six months ago. My older brother, and he was. Uh, now I am the only survivor, and I have one first cousin that's still living, um, and she's as old as I am. So that's that'll be the the beginning of the generation. Well, I've been, I've all been all, I've been very active actually. I flew airplanes when I was in university at New Mexico. I um, joined a group uh, of Jacqueline Cochran's uh, uh, students. I didn't say I joined, I was accepted. At, uh, uh, to learn the, de the basics of flying uh, so that I uh, could go into the uh, Women's Air Force. Uh, the government did not provide the flying, so I had to work uh, in grocery stores and any place I could get money to, buy, to pay for um, flying lessons. And that was back in the 40s, and that was, uh, I recall, six dollars a half an hour. That was a lot of money in the 40s. What and were you earning in the grocery store? Yeah. What was your hourly wage? Uh, well, uh, it was 25 cents an hour and at the university. I think at the, uh, the grocery store it was a little higher. <laughs> uh, but, um, I um, took flying lessons solo and was uh, ready to go into the uh, um, uh, uh, Women's Air Force. At least I was going to go. I didn't. I shouldn't say I registered. But I had one more maneuver to make before I could go, and that was to do cross country. And cross country means leaving Albuquerque and going down south and coming back. And the war was over before I got that in. <laughs> <laughs> so then I didn't. It was my father, father's suggestion that I go and join the armed forces to get money to go to university. He said they'll pay for your university. He said, I, he said, go to the wax. I said, oh, go to the waves. No, Dad. Uh, and he didn't know about the Women's Air Force, but I learned about it at the University of New Mexico. Was your tuition paid for? No. No, the government didn't. They, they, they just provided the, uh, the, they gave us a uniform. <laughs> Tuesdays and Thursday night. I you <laughs> wore a uniform, <laughs> um, but we. Um, what was your uniform like? Hmm? What did it? Oh, it was just a plain uh, drab, uh, tan uniform. It didn't have anything that identified you as as being a potential uh, soldier. <laughs> was it a skirt? No, it was pants. pants? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I have um, one of the um, girls that became uh, uh, that uh, rather attended the uh, session. Also, she and I used to fly together, and uh, we would uh, in Albuquerque at that time. The, the bus only went to uh, Central and Coors. And we take the bus and to go to Cutacar uh, Airport, and we would have our logbook. And uh, anybody that came along in a car knew what a logbook was, and would pick us up if they were going to the airport. <laughs> and, That's great. Um, she became um, the reason she became such a good friend of mine was that uh, she was a a student, completely a student in UNM, but she came to me one day and said, 
I don't know how to use, they call it a little, uh, like a slide rule or only bigger, an E6B computer. And she said, I can't work this. Can you show me how to work it? And I said, thought to myself, this Harriet Lanto coming to me and asking me how to teach her to use this? I thought, oh, great. So I did, and we became good friends after that. I never knew her before then. <laughs> and then she came to Los Alamos uh, to work uh, when I went up there and when I left uh, to go to school. She uh, came to Chicago also, but she didn't like Chicago, so she came back to New Mexico. Mm -hmm. but, uh, when you were in Chicago, where, where did you live? South Side. Um, um, near the Hyde, Hyde Park um, on Kenwood. So that was a good commute to the to Argonne Laboratory. Was it? Where was Argonne Laboratory located then? Where was Argonne? It was across the Midway, south of, on 66th mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. Then they moved it. What? Then they moved it out to Lamont. Yes, they um, they moved the laboratory to Lamont uh, and called it Argonne. At the time when it was uh, at the University of Chicago, it was called the Medical Laboratory. Uh, so, do you remember the kinds of um, health? effects of radiation that you discovered? But, but what did your research lead you to conclude about the dangers of radiation on chromosomes and, and cells? And, and the nucleus of the living cell, yes. Um, uh, the latter part of my research was mostly on chromosomes and uh, I was able to identify a um, a chromosome that a, a young child had that um, uh, the, the chromosome had a, a, some of it missing and that was using the computer at the Jet Propulsion Lab and uh, because you could at that time you could see six, 64 levels that was great now I don't know how many levels you could. and um, but I identified this uh, chromosome that was defective. And uh, I don't know if the child uh, continued to live or not, but she did have some problems. And she was from the East. Uh, and, uh, we did a lot, a lot of research on uh, as I said, the rats and, and the, <laughs> the mice and, and the hamsters and um, it, all, it all involved looking at uh, cells that uh, had been irradiated. So uh, a lot of times we did the radiation at different times to see how long it took for a some effect to take, and and uh, at other times it was uh, looking at cells that uh, um, that um, you know had doses of radiation that they that just were completely where the chromosomes were were completely uh, destroyed, but most of the uh, high level radiation uh, cells had broken chromosomes uh, and, and that was what I was looking at and then I was able to get a little, you know, at Harkon and then I'm going to Jet Propulsion Lab and I was able to uh, see uh, deeper into the effects of, of radiation on chromosomes. And, uh, uh, very important work. Can you talk about how the research changed 
from when you first started to when you retired and then if you've been keeping up with it even since then? Well, I guess the way it changed was more technology was introduced and the, um, the, the you know, possibilities of, of looking at uh, 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 effects differently than we, we did originally. Um, I can remember when I was uh, hired at Argonne and the reason I was hired um, was that the, when they had the radiation accident involving Sloten, two doctors from the, uh, Chicago mm -hmm. came, and one was a pathologist from Argonne National Laboratory, and his name was Dr. Herman Lesko, and the other was uh, a hematologist from uh, Bill, uh, Billings Hospital, uh, uh, Dr. Allen, and uh, I worked with both of them at a, as a technician, just getting things prepared for them uh, for, what, for whatever they were doing, taking tissues, and um, they both heard that I would, wanted to go to Chicago uh, to the university. And they both asked me to come and work with them. <laughs> and Dr. Allen said, you can stay with us and, and uh, you wouldn't have to play, pay room and board if you babysat with the kids. I said, babysat, I did that all my life with it. <laughs> and Dr. Uh, Lisko said, um, you come and, and work at Argonne. And um, I said, I uh, decided I'd go to Oregon, and I thought I was going to work with Dr. Lesko, but I in, instead was assigned to the uh, be the uh, one of the assistant research people for uh, Dr. Bruce, who was the director of biology and medical division at Oregon. So I I worked with Dr. Bruce, and it was just after. Um, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki had had been um, uh, destroyed by uh, the uh, two bo uh, atomic bombs. He ha was sent over to Japan, and uh, before he left, he said, "I want you to have living cells growing on nylon film." And uh, so he came back. And I had living cells growing on nylon film, and I didn't know why. And the reason was he wanted to detect the radiation in the cells, and the radiation was carbon-14, and that, that would, uh, had a short rays, but it would go through nylon film, it wouldn't go through glass, mm -hmm. and that he could put a, a radiation monitor over the uh, dish or the bottle that I had the cells growing on and uh, pick out the radiation. That was, a, uh, that was my first start. And I, so I, I worked with him for 22 years. <laughs> oh my. Um, Dr. Bruce was a, uh, a wonderful person. He, he was so knowledgeable in physics and everything as, as far as radiation was concerned. And in 22 years, I never saw um, uh, emotion, uh, let's see, um, sadness or anything until the day that uh, J.F. Kennedy was assassinated. We were in the laboratory and we heard that JFK had been assassinated, and I thought I saw him crying. That's the first time, and never saw it again. Did he do any work with the effects of radiation on the Japanese survivors? No, no. Um, I was asked to look at chromosomes from uh, some of the survivors. Uh, 
on uh, Bikini, and let's see, one of the islands where the bomb uh, was very uh, was, was dropped, and the they, the island was very close, but the uh, material that they sent me was just impossible to read. That's a, that was the only time I got anywhere ne uh, near uh, radiation uh, outside of the United States. <laughs> How did you feel when you learned that the work that was done at Los Alamos was to develop a bomb and huh? that it had been dropped on Japan? Oh, you know, uh, as I said, we didn't know until after it was dropped. I, um, the only the only uh, reaction I had to that was that a lot of American soldiers were saved. Uh, that, uh, and, uh, and that it was a, it was a good thing. Some some of the scientists didn't think so though. So going back to. Um Louis Slotin, how, like that, that must have been very unusual to see that accident. How did that, did that affect you in any way or how did you feel about that? It did, it, uh, I just, uh, I couldn't believe what was going on. On this, this person I was taking blood from every day and then for him to get, uh, to get to get so large in such a short period of time, it is. I knew that something was going to happen. That I didn't think he was going to live because his blood cells, white blood cell count, really hit, went down faster than uh, uh, Al Graves. Yes. What did they do to treat Al Graves? How was it that he was able to survive? Oh, no, they, there wasn't anything. They didn't have anything. No, he just, uh, his blood cell finally started coming up a little. Uh, that was a week after the, it went way down and then it started coming up a little and a little and a little and a little more. Oh my God, everybody was so happy. And he, and uh, if he wasn't able to make white blood cells, he would have been dead before uh, Slotin, I think. Uh, I don't know. Was he able to have children after that? I don't know. I don't think he died after that, no. Not that I know of. Yeah. His wife, uh, uh, was a physicist at Los Alamos also, and um, but I, I I lost track of them when I left Los Alamos until I met him and uh, um, and would come back to visit met, met him in Oregon and would come back to visit him. Uh, 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 to visit the everybody at Los Alamos. That was when we uh, we'd we'd all go skiing. We made we uh, the ski run at Los Alamos was made by us. We'd go down <laughs> and walk back up and then go down. <laughs> was that Sawyer Hill or Pararito? What was it? What was it called? Where you went skiing? Did it have a name? Well, uh, we didn't. Uh, well, it was called Pajarito uh, Hill, but then it became Pajarito uh, Ski. Whatever. So, do you remember Enrico Fermi skiing and other people like Hans Bethe or other scientists? Well, Bill Bright, uh, uh, Becky. Uh, uh, I think it's like a Wes Jones, I'm trying to think of Becky's last name. Um, there were several of us. Uh, we used to go out on the weekends, uh, not many, but some, to go up to Colorado and ski. 
and we did the same thing with uh, uh, one of the other ski runs, which is very popular. We'd go take us an hour to get to the top and two minutes to get down or less, <laughs> and, then, and then walk back up. And, uh, Did you climb up on your skis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a way we yeah. Do it. yeah. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yes, it was. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit more about when you would go to the Pueblo to visit, to Santa Clara to visit? Oh, I didn't Because growing, <clears throat> growing up you didn't live there, so talk about that. Well, um, I didn't visit my father at Santa Clara. He was in Albuquerque, but uh, I would go down uh, and visit the relatives, and uh, um, quite a few of them uh, in the 70s uh, took uh, certain jobs up at Los Alamos. Uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, I, I, I uh, went to the uh, dances, the Indian dances, uh, which were held uh, quite often, and, but the big one was on August 12th, which they called Feast Day, and, and uh, I would go there. And in the meantime, my grandson, Pat's son, uh, lives in uh, Manhattan, New York, and uh, has a uh, works there. He has come back. I shouldn't say he has come back, but he has now, uh, for the last two years, participated in the Indian dances. And he's only a fourth Indian, but uh, he's an eighth. Eight. You're a fourth. Uh, but he has been accepted so well in, in, the, in the Pueblo uh, that they uh, the council agreed uh, to, to let him participate uh, in the dances, and I think that's absolutely wonderful. I uh, did not live in the Pueblo, but uh, my visits have always been with relatives, which uh, are the cousins. Uh, and uh, I can't. Uh, I'd, I'd, uh, most of them are have that live in the pueblo have jobs outside, and in Santa Fe or uh, other places. Uh, you know, and, you know, um, I, uh, the pueblo is uh, almost the same as it was when I uh, uh, first. Uh, visited uh, that I remember visiting. I was uh, uh, five years old when I was going to be in the uh, Indian dance, and uh, I had to practice the day before to be in one of the dances the next day. But my grandmother died the next day, so I couldn't get. To, I didn't uh, participate in any dances. After that, I didn't participate in that one either. Um, but uh, when I do go back to the Pueblo, I see that a lot of the same structures that were still there when I was five years old. <laughs> My grandmother's house is not there anymore, but. Um, some of the, uh, I guess uh, the uh, adobe uh, does not stand the rain very much, and we've been having uh, rainfalls that they were not predict predicted, you know, uh, in New Mexico, and uh, but, um, her roof was uh, just mud and straw and vigas. I could remember that. And the floor was just uh, uh, dirt uh, that was packed very hard, and then rugs at different places. Um, 
She was my grandmother. Uh, when we went out to play, she would uh, may, uh, tor take uh, blue corn tortillas and heat them uh, until they became uh, uh, hard enough to eat like uh, potato chips. And we'd come in from playing when I would go to visit the Pueblo. We'd come in and play from playing and that was our candy. She'd give us a, a corn tortilla. Uh, as I remember that much about my grandmother. Uh, the only other thing I remember that uh, has stayed in my mind is that when she died, uh, someone had to be with the body for four days. And uh, I was, I took my turn. <laughs> and I can still see my grandmother lying, and she had the Indian boots, the white leather Indian boots, and uh, she was in her boots on the table. <laughs> and I, 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 I think I, I probably had a two R's, maybe more. I don't remember that much. But uh, that has always stayed in my mind. Uh, Did she have a, a, a dress on? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, the end dress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How old was he, she when she died? How old was she? I think she was in her 90s. I think that's what they said. Yeah. I don't know. Grandpa had uh, had died before that I really before I really knew him. Uh, so uh, but uh, it is uh, interesting to know that my great grandfather is hanging on the wall in the lobby. Uh, really? How, uh, yes, uh, Santiago Naranjo. Uh, uh, tell him where it is. He, uh, he's hanging. He's, all, this, he's all dressed in white uh, leather, and he's hanging in the lobby. His, his portrait is hanging uh, in the lobby. Uh, yeah. Was he the chief of the Santa Clara, the uh, head of it? He, he had been, yes. So that's why they chose him for the portrait. All I know is my, uh, my grandfather uh, was uh, was very. Uh, my grandfather was always sent to Washington uh, for uh, well land uh, agreements and, and and different other different things, and he he was I guess quite a politician and. Uh, he had something to do with uh, forming the the Winter Party. That they uh, uh, they resented that most of the people did, but the Winter Party and and there's, there's a Summer Party, and uh, like the like the Republicans and the Democrats. <laughs> yeah. So um, Alex just asked, was it unusual that your Indian father and your white mother got married? in that time. Yes, it was. <laughs> Talk um, about that. And what year um, was that? What uh, year did they get married? They got married in 1914 uh, or 15. And um, uh, they went up to Animas, Colorado, and were married there. And then they send the wedding invitations to Indiana. They uh, they would not send the them before they got married because they knew that my uh, white relatives would object to her marrying an Indian. <laughs> <laughs> but her mother was very supportive, right? Was very right. Your mother's mother was supportive. Yes. Uh huh. <clears throat> She lived, with, she lived with you for a while, right? She, uh, yeah, well, my grandpa, my white grandfather died in Indiana and uh, grandma came to live with us. And I, I think I was probably 10, 11 years of age when she came. And I can remember 
um, having uh, coffee with her, and uh, that's how I learned how to drink coffee. But she would put a lot of milk in it, <laughs> and we would uh, talk, and uh, she would be doing gro crocheting and whatever, and. Uh, she said, uh, you got to learn how to do this. And I said, oh, Grandma, I have to work on my stamps. I was a stamp collector. And uh, she said, well, that's not learning anything. And I said, well, Grandma, do you know where Afghanistan is? What? <laughs> do, you, do you know where such and such is? No. Who are? <laughs> I said, well, that's what I've learned. Uh, my stamps, and uh, so we got along real well. We we talked a lot, uh, and uh, uh, she uh, died of a massive heart attack, and uh, and I was uh, she did. See, I was I was the first uh, first uh, I was a freshman when she died at UNM. I remember that, yes. But she, yeah, you know, once Grandma came to live with us, uh, you know, at the Indian school, there were white, there were Indians that were teaching, and they, we all gathered together, and she was became part of the uh, the whole society, and she seemed to love it. Uh, uh, but uh, it's it's like um, uh, uh, New Mexico was another world from Indiana, and and you um, have different uh, views of how people live, and and they don't know that they just thought people were uncivilized <laughs> savages. When I went to grade school and. Uh, St. Mary's, the nuns would come from the East and to teach, and they would talk about the savages at the Indian school, because that's all they knew that the Indians were called savages. <laughs> and that really got to me, you know, I just, <laughs> but um, I finally, I finally realized the reason for the some of the prejudice is that part. People just didn't know, and they still don't know. <laughs> they don't know about the New Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Over the course of your lifetime, do you think the relationships in New Mexico between the different cultures and races have improved or changed? Oh, I think they've been. Yes. They have. They've improved and, and they've changed you know, a lot. And, uh, Can you explain? They begin. They, they begin. <clears throat> I think they begin to realize that uh, Indians are not savages. Indians are just as intelligent as as uh, white people are. Um, we have uh, from uh, our pueblo. There's the two Dozier boys have PhDs. Edward Dozier and his brother, uh, I think, they got, and uh, uh, our cousin Joe that we were talking about, he has a master's degree from Harvard. And there are others who have uh, PhDs that I don't, I've never met. But uh, you know, it's, uh, and you look, I, I say, well, this person who has a PhD has a white father and an Indian mother. I have a white mother and an Indian father. And I'm thinking, uh, where does it, and, and the rest of them I know who have uh, other degrees have Indian heritage, uh, mothers or fathers, so that uh, where the intelligence comes from is a combination of the genes. It's it's not necessarily the white gene or the Indian gene. Uh, it's so. 
Anyway, the, the Indians are getting some recognition, but certainly not from Washington, the president. <laughs> well, at least it's uh, um, um, made some of the Indians, uh, I would say, more wealthy. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think the worst effect of Los Alamos not just on the Pueblo, but all the surrounding area, is uh, the radiation that has caused leukemia. I have four relatives. Two are my sister and my brother have died of leukemia. Uh, a cousin, two cousins have died of leukemia. And um, there are my... Uh, technician I had at Los Alamos in, uh, in the 70s, she is dying of leukemia. So there, I think that, uh, that the radiation has something to do with it. You know. I, I, I have no way of proving that or it's, it's just a speculation of uh, Radiation is bad. <laughs> so, talk a little bit about going to visit the Pueblo while you were growing up. Well, uh, I, I, all I can say is that that uh, I, 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 we played with cousins, and uh, I had cousins coming out of my ears, <laughs> uh, and we. We played all the, the uh, games that um, the white children played, kick the can, and, um, uh, and a, something with a, anyway, baseball, uh, you know, we were, um, I, uh, I can't really tell you anything about the, the uh, politics of uh, the Pueblo, Except that uh, several of my my relatives have served as either governor or uh, other uh, related uh, the political positions, and uh, I said I was going to tell you I can't remember now. How how does the pueblo? Um, regard women. You've talked about a lot of your male relatives becoming governors and having a, a, an important role in, in the Pueblo. How are women regarded? Are you kind of an exception that you've gone on to be, um, you know, have a scientific career? Oh, they just accept me as I was. I mean, they, they're, they're proud of me, but it's uh, not that you're better than I am. It's, and I don't think I'm better than they are. It's, um, but how about, how about other women who are members of the Pueblo? Have they had opportunities similar to you? Do you know other women who have, who have um, gotten PhDs from the they, Pueblo? Have they had the opportunities? Uh, well, um, there is money provided now uh, uh, for uh, students who are going for bachelor's degree and, and doctor's degree. Now, when I was at University of Chicago in the 60s, I had uh, maybe a couple of years to finish, and I was uh, uh, just financially uh, unable to really uh, do uh, to uh, I paid the bills, but we, uh, uh, I couldn't get uh, buy things I wanted. Uh, so I went to the Department of Education at, uh, in Washington, D.C. And uh, as I walked down the hall, um, this was, excuse me, not the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs at, in Washington, D.C. And as I walked down the hall, uh, the, the 
nameplates stuck out. And there was one, Mrs. Frenchville, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Perry. And Dr. Perry was uh, the, uh, 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 a superintendent of, of the Albuquerque Indian School. And Mrs. Frenchville was, I guess, a secretary, if I remember. And so I went into, they took me into uh, Dr. Perry's office and, and uh, he was so surprised because <laughs> he, he, he didn't believe that, uh, uh, that, that I was going for a doctor's degree. Then he told me to go talk to Mrs. Frenchville. I was trying to get the money to, go, to finish my education and she said, there is no money allocated for Indians to go on after a bachelor's degree, and that was it. So I walked out and came back. <laughs> but um, uh, it, it's a little, di it's different t today. The Indians have uh, um, some help. I don't know how much. I, I haven't really talked with any of the Indians that are going to school now, but I do know that that uh, there is uh, some money available. That I I didn't get any uh, wasn't able to get any money to get my bachelor's degree. I had to uh, uh, do it on my own. I did get one scholarship um, after I graduated from, from uh, Albuquerque High School. And that was it. And it was just enough to pay one tuition for one semester. When, when your parents got married, you were talking about how they sent the wedding invitations back to Indiana mm -hmm. after the wedding. How about on Grandpa's side, on the Santa Clara side? Did, oh were my, oh were my, they at oh, all worried about your, all your mother the, being? Oh, you know? they, they just loved my mother. And my mother just loved Indians. She, uh, as I said, was destined to marry an Indian, and she just became one of them. Uh, when she was teaching in the Indian school, uh, her uh, children were just like us. She treated them the same way, and she was. Uh, she must have had some Indi some Indian blood in her. <laughs> Did you know Lewis Hempelman? He was a nice guy. He was he was great. I uh, was invited to his house here in Santa Fe. It, uh, it was uh, north of Santa Fe, uh, between Espanola and Santa Fe. Uh, I forgot what name uh, for um, parties, and uh, he was he was just. Uh, all around person, no no prejudices. Uh, he was he was fun to work with. Uh, I remember. I knew Dr. Lewis Hempelman when he was director of the medical division at Los Alamos uh, while the bomb was being developed. And I worked I worked uh, with him in the laboratory uh, while. Uh, while when he uh, was there, I probably went to Chicago and before he left, but I don't know anything about that. Did you know the Oppenheimers at all? I didn't know him really in a social way. Uh, I mean, he he seemed to be a a very very. Uh, Nice person, and uh, uh, I agree with uh, practically everybody in the, at Los Alamos who were there at the time that I was. And that he was not a communist, and, um, and that was a terrible thing for I think it was a, uh, teller. To, to say about him, but he he directed the laboratory in such a way that uh, it was a pleasant place to be. 
Um, he, he went against uh, uh, Dr. Groves, uh, suggesting that all the uh, Los Alamos people uh, be dressed in uniform and be like soldiers, and, and uh, he objected to that. And Dr. Graves, uh, uh, Dr. Groves, uh, accepted his his challenge. <laughs> yeah. Did you ever work with Kitty Oppenheimer in the lab? No, I didn't. <laughs> I knew Dr. Robert Oppenheimer at Los Alamos, but I was not socially uh, involved with him or his wife. <laughs>